Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here today to continue reading Journey to the River Sea by Eva Abotson, pictures by Kevin Hawks, and this book is published by Puffin Books. We're going to pick up where we left off with chapter 10 after Clovis, Finn, and Maya are um, constructing a plan to send Clovis back to England instead of Finn. Chapter 10. The Manus Museum of Natural History was very quiet this week at weekday morning. The boy who swept the floor was outside, weeding the flower beds. The porter dozed in his cubicle, and there were no visitors. But behind his, behind the office in his lab, Professor Glastonbury was worrying about the giant sloth. He often worried about the sloth. For the past year, he'd been putting the skeleton of the great beast together, and it was going to make an ex impressive exhibit. At least it should have. For the truth was that the skeleton was not quite complete. It was nearly complete, but not quite. One rib was missing, the third rib on the left-hand side. Professor Glastonbury had made a false rib out of plaster of Paris, and now he fitted it carefully into the breastbone. And it looked fine. At least it did, if you didn't know. The trouble was that the professor did know. He looked at his handiwork. The sloth on its metal stand seemed to fill the whole room. He took the right one rib out. He put it in again. He sighed. A false rib was cheating, but a missing rib was untidy. At that moment, he heard the creaking of the revolving doors and peering out, realized that two people had come into the museum who he recognized. The tall, thin woman who had been interested in Bernard Tavner's collection and the schoolgirl who had been with her, a girl with a lot of dark hair and intelligent eyes. He came out of his office and said, good morning. The woman smiled and at once looked less alarming. This is Maya, she said. She has come to make some drawing of bird's wings. May I leave her here to work on her own? I'll fetch her at three o'clock. I don't think she'll be in any trouble. I'm sure she won't, said the professor. He was still holding the false rib and looked distracted. What a large rib, said Miss Minton. Yes. He took a deep breath and poured out the problem of the missing bone. No one would know it was not the real one, he said. Miss Minton looked severe. You would know, she said. The professor sighed. That's what Tavner used to say. May we see it? The sloth, said Maya. Certainly. He led them through his office and into the lab. It's not upside down, said Maya. That sloths were always hung from trees. Not the giant sloths. They would have splintered any tree they tried to hang from. This one would have weighed about four tons when it was alive. But they've been extinct for thousands of years. Once again, the professor put the rib in, and once again, he took it out. What do you think? I think you should go and find the missing bone, said Miss Minton. The professor stared at her. Was she serious? Surely not. I'm afraid that's impossible, he said. The original skeleton came from a cave from near the Zandi River, miles to the north. And I'm too old for expeditions. Nonsense, said Miss Minton. Anyone who can walk can go on expeditions. Here's a picture of Maya, Professor Glastonbury, and Miss Minton looking at the skeleton. Then she took her leave and Maya said good morning to the stuffed Pekingese before settling down at a table near the Birds in Flight exhibit and began to draw. It was good to just be in the museum away, again and away from the Carters. Not just the Pekingese, but the Amazonian river slug, the lumpy manatee, the shrunken head, they all seemed like old friends and of course the Tavner collection, which she now saw with new eyes. As she drew, Maya tried to puzzle out the problem of her governess. Maya had told Miss Minton that Clovis was safe with the, with the boy, but Miss Minton had nodded, but she asked no more questions. It was strange how little she asked Maya about her comings and goings when she pounced on every strand of unbrushed hair or fingernail not scrubbed to cleanliness. Then when Maya said that she needed to go and work in the museum to finish her projects on birds of the rainforest, and he had done no more than raise an eyebrow and had gone about arranging it. She'd even persuaded Mrs. Carter to let them go down in the rubber boat so as to give them more time in menace. And why did Finn want to know Miss Minton's Christian name? But she wasn't in the museum to think about Minty or even to draw birds. She was there to do a job for Finn, and when she was sure that the museum was empty, she walked over to the door marked private and knocked. Professor Glastonbury came out at once. He really was a very nice man with his round pink face and white fringe of hair. I'm sorry to disturb you again, said Maya, but I have a message for you. And she handed him the note that Finn had written in the hut. The professor read it and looked at her intently. 
So she had found Finn and wanted to make friends with him. Not only that, but she wanted to help him. Yes, he said, I see. You are a messenger and are to be trusted. Come in. He led her into his office and locked the door. Maya had never seen such a room. There wasn't an inch that wasn't covered in something. Limb cast, snake skins, jumbled bones, and books everywhere, even on the floor. But it was a friendly clutter, not like the mess in Mr. Carter's room. Sit down, he said, and moved a stuffed marmoset from a rickety chair. Then he read the note again. I don't see why not. If it's just for one night. No, I really don't see why not. He said that you know a good hiding place. He said you showed it to him. Professor Glastonbury smiled. He must have been close to 60, but he looked like a pleased pink baby. Ah, he remembered, did he? Well, come along. If Finn says that you are to be trusted, I am sure he's right. He took her into the lab, and for a second time, Maya was led to the giant sloth. But this time, the professor put his shoulder to the heavy metal stand, which moved slowly to one side. On the wooden floor, grimed with dirt, Maya could just make out a square of darker colored wood and an iron ring. It's a trap door, he says. Goes down to a cellar and a storeroom, but it's well ventilated. Got one high window. Best hiding place in man, as we used to say. Flynn liked to play down there when he was little, while his father helped me. Maya stood looking at the flight of steps which led into the darkness. Would you like to go down? The professor asked. May I? Of course, but you better have a light. There's no electricity down there. He brought her a hurricane lamp, and she climbed down. The cellar was huge and vaulted, with a recess at the back full of packing cases. Between the cases were exhibits which the professor had not the room for, or those waiting to be repaired. A beam of light fell on the red eyes of a moth-eaten puma. There were unstring bows and painted shields and a harpy eagle sitting on a lopsided nest. In a corner was a heap of round objects which might have been carved coconuts, but also might have been shrunken heads. But the floor was dry, and at the far corner of the room, the high window gave, gave a glimmer of light. It's marvelous, Maya said, coming up again. No one could find you unless they knew. The professor moved the stand back over the trap door. I sometimes store Billy down there when the trustees come for an inspection. They don't approve of a stuffed Pekingese in a serious museum. It's, there's just one more thing, said Maya, as the professor led her out the, of the lab. Finn thought that we should that I should steal the spare keys so that no one gets in trouble, your staff or you, if anything goes wrong. I doubt if anyone could do much to me, said Professor Glastonbury, but that's true, I wouldn't want my cleaners or my caretaker blamed. The trouble is, Maya said, looking at him, I haven't actually stolen anything before. There's always the first time, said the professor, cheerfully. The spare keys are hanging on that hook over there, and I'm going out in a half an hour to have my lunch. There she is, said Mr. Trapwood, looking out of the window of the Pension Maria at the slender blue funnels of the RMS Bishop, sister ship of the Cardinal, which had just come into port. She would spend four days on the turnabout while the crew cleaned the ship, took on supplies, and had time ashore. Then on Saturday morning, she would set off again to the mouth of the Amazon, across the Atlantic, and back to Britain. The crows had been so sure of finding Taverner's son that they had booked a three-berth cabin for the return journey. But they were beginning to give up hope, for it was clear that the wretched boy was deliberately hiding from them. At first, people had tried to deny that Taverner had a son at all. Now, though, they were beginning to laugh behind their sleeves, and as the day for the detective's departure grew closer, there were sly digs about the boy having outwitted them. But why? The crows were hurt. They had come as bearers of good tidings to bring a savage jungle boy the news of his inheritance. They had been prepared to introduce him gradually to polite society. Perhaps on the journey, teach him to use a knife and fork. Sir Aubrey had even given them some money to buy him clothes, in case he'd been brought up in a grass skirt. They'd expected gratitude. It was only natural. Thank you, Mr. Lowe, the boy would have said, grasping them by the hand. And thank you, Mr. Trapwood. You have saved me from a life of toil and darkness. Instead of that, the boy was deliberately hiding, and everyone in Manus seemed to be helping him. We've got three more days, said Mr. Trapwood. There's still a chance to flush him out to carry him aboard by force if necessary, to get the bonus from Sir Aubrey. That was the most important thing of all. Sir Aubrey had promised them a hundred pounds each if they brought his grandson safely home. I still think there was something fishy about that pigtailed girl at the Carter's place. Mr. Lowe agreed. She had a shifty look. I'll have to keep an eye on her. The crows were looking very much worse for wear. Their black suits were dusty and torn. The maid at the pension Maria had burned every one of their shirts as she ironed them. Mr. Trapwood's face was covered in lumps where the bites of the tabernid fly had gone septic, and both their stomachs had become boiling cavernies of agony and wind. 
But we can still do it, said Mr. Trapwood, punching the table. We'll try downriver this time. Those houses by the fishing place. The people looked there, there looked poor enough. They should sit, take some notice of the reward. Mr. Lowe nodded and made his way stealthily towards the door. If you think you are getting to the laboratory before me, don't try, said Mr. Trapwood. I'm going first. No, you aren't. I need it. You need it. Uh, shuffling and jostling, the two detectives raced each other down the corridor. Professor Glastonbury made his way up the hill to the cafe where he usually had his lunch and stopped, as he always did, by the bookshop in the square. It was run by a man who bought his books from all over Brazil, specializing in books about natural history. In the window was a copy of Travels in the Amazon by Alfred Russell Wallace, open at a beautiful woodcut of an Indian village. He was admiring it when he realized that the tall, straight-backed woman who was... Um, Tall, straight-backed woman was also staring at the window, was the lady who had left Maya in the museum. Beautiful book, he said, raising his hat. Yes, she sighed, quite above my means, I fear. It's not a first edition. You might get quite a reasonable price. I know the owner. Perhaps he would put it aside for a while. Thank you, but he would have to put it aside for most of my life. My salary is not princely, even when it is paid. Both of them looked for a while longer at the book. Then Miss Minton gave her tight-lipped smile. I was dismissed once for reading, she said. Really? The professor waited, but she said no more. I left Maya working hard, he, he went on. The caretaker promised to keep an eye on her. Did she know what Maya was really doing in the museum, he wondered? Probably not, yet she did not look like a person easy to hoodwink. And as she bent down to pick up the basket with Mrs. Card shopping in it, he said, Allow me. She shook her head. Thank you, but it is not heavy. They began to walk towards the main street with its cafe and shops. I've been thinking about what you said, about the missing bone, of the sloth, I mean. You've decided to go and look for it? No, no, but Tavener also was against putting in a false rib. He was a good naturalist and a good man. I miss him. Yes, I can imagine that. Was it he who found the skeleton? No, no, it was on many years ago. He went to a museum in Rio. Too important for my little place. But no one ever had time to assemble it, so they sent it down to me. But Tavener knew the place that it came from. Not only that, he broke off. His wife came from up there, he went on. It's practically unexplored country. Did you know his wife? Yes, she was beautiful and gentle. She died in childbirth because the English doctor wouldn't come out to a native girl at night. As you can imagine, it didn't make Tavener any more anxious to return to England. They walked on for a while without speaking. Then the professor, blushing a little, for he was very shy, asked Miss Minton if she would care to join him for lunch. It's only a little local cafe, but the food is good. But as he, ex he expected, she refused. Thank you, I have some sandwiches. But at the door of the cafe, Miss Minton was overcome suddenly by the glorious smell of real, strong Brazilian coffee. Perhaps a cup of coffee, she said. It was a nice cafe, friendly and cheap, and it cost Miss Minton some effort not to allow the professor to buy her a dish of chicken and rice. I lunched here most days, he said, since my wife died. Was that a long time ago? Yes, ten years now. I blame myself. The climate didn't suit her, and I should have taken her back to England. Miss Minton frowned. She did not approve of people blaming themselves for what was done. Are the caves difficult to reach? The ones where your sloth came from, she asked. Yes, difficult but not impossible. Did Tavener think there would be more remains there? More bones? He thought there might be, but that's neither here nor there. She'll be 58 next year. An old man. That is the kind of remark I don't enjoy, said Miss Minton cuttingly, and picked up her coffee cup. When she came back from the museum, Maya found the twins in an even worse mood than usual. What are these supposed to be? Breacher sneered, turning over Maya's drawings. I can't make head or tail of them. I know, Maya sighed, but birds are really difficult to draw. Well, then why do you have to go and show off in the museum, then? Suppose you wanted to say everyone to say how clever you are. And you've got a mosquito bite on your forehead, said Gwendolyn. It looks like the kind that goes septic. And you've probably caught lice, too, on that boat. You better not come near. Maya said nothing and went to her room. She had stopped wondering what she had done to annoy them. But to tell the truth, the poor twins had just learned something which accept them very much, and they had learned it from their mother. We don't like Maya, Mommy, the twins had said. She's a prig. The way she goes on practicing the piano when she doesn't have to. 
and she flirts with the boys at dancing class and shows off the whole time. And she's conceited about her hair, the way she brushes it and brushes it. She sneaks off to talk to the servants. Mrs. Carter sighed. I know you don't like her, she said. We hate her, said Beatrice. When is she going away again, wailed Gwendolyn. Oh, don't, cried Mrs. Carter, caught off her guard. Don't ever mention her going away. If Maya goes, we are undone. The twins stared at her. Their small, round mouths hung open. Mrs. Carter tried to pull herself together. No, no, it is not as bad as that. Your father... There has been some difficulties with the price of rubber, and so on. Maya's allowance from her guardian is absolutely necessary to pay the bills. You mean she's staying us, staying with us forever and ever, said Beatrice, just because she's rich and we're poor? It isn't fair. Now, please, girls, I'm sure your father will find a way round, and when he does, we can send her away. But just for now, please try to be nicer to, to Maya. The twins shot her a furious look from under their pale eyelashes. We'll have to think of something, said Beatrice, when they were alone. We certainly will, said Gwendolyn. But if we get rid of her, we won't be able to have any new clothes. Unless we can get hold of the reward for the, the, reward for the Tavener boy. If we get that, we won't need to see Maya ever again, said Beatrice gloatingly. I still think that she knows something. I'm going to watch her day and night. I'm going to watch her too. When she had first seen Finn's hut in the lagoon, Maya thought it must be the nicest place in the whole world. Clovis did not think that at all. He liked being inside the hut, especially at meal times, but he found the surrounding jungle most alarming. The anteater lumbering down to drink like a gray tank set Clovis rushing back indoors, and the chattering of the monkeys in the trees kept him awake at night. Finn made him help with all the chores. Clovis had to keep the hut clean, scrub out the saucepans, and help get the Arabella ready for her journey. Clovis liked the hummingbirds. He learned to refill their bottles of sugar water, and he didn't mind painting the boat. He was used to painting scenery, but cleaning the bilges and burying the kitchen waste was not to his taste at all. But if Clovis wasn't very good at rough work, he was absolutely first class at learning his lines. Every morning and every afternoon, he sat down with the old red notebook in which Finn had written down all that his father had told him about Westwood, and when Finn tested him, he found Clovis word perfect. There isn't much... Finn told him at the beginning, because my father never talked about Westwood if he could help it. And remember, they won't expect you to know anything. They probably think that you've been brought up a savage. All the same, if you're going to stay for a week or two without being found out, it might help you to know a little. So Clovis sat by the table in the hut, twisting a curl around his finger, and studied the notebook, and every hour or two, Finn came in and tested him. What does the front of the house look like? It was built by Sir John Van Brewer. There are two wings, an east wing and a west wing, and in the middle is a block with six stone columns where the main rooms are. And what about the statues? There's a statue of Hercules strangling a snake in front of the west wing, and a statue of St. George spearing a dragon in front of the east wing. Now go through the front door. Think of yourself as coming back to where your father grew up. Think of yourself as Bernard Tavner's son. And he had to turn his face away, as he remembered how good it had really been to be his father's son, and how much he missed him. If you go into the great hall, which is always cold, with a flagstone floor and a big oak chest into which Dudley shut your father for a whole night when he was three years old, Clovis broke off. Dudley is dead, isn't he? Of course he's dead, said Finn impatiently. That's what all the fuss is about. Go on, go upstairs. There's a long gallery with a knight's armor, very tall, which used to shine in the dark. Once Dudley got inside, made it right into his arm, and a housemaid fainted. Then there's a picture of a Tavner ancestor who went on the Crusades with the head of a Turk impaled on his lance. Clovis sighed. Westwood did not sound cozy. What about Joan, Finn went on. Remember, she's your Aunt Joan, really. Where was her room? On the next floor, overlooking the stables. The walls were completely covered with rosettes that she'd won for riding. Red ones and yellow ones and blue ones. And she had a fox's tail with dried blood on it nailed above her bed. Only it isn't called a tail, it's called a brush. And what was her nickname? The Basher, because she bashed people. He looked anxiously at Finn. But she isn't there now, is she? You promised. No, of course not. She's married to a man called Smith and has four daughters. But he could see that Clovis was looking far from happy, so he flicked over the pages of the notebook to find a few things at Westwood which Bernard had liked. What about the bluebell wood? It's on the far side of the lake, not where Joan held his head under the water. On a slope down the river, there was a pair of woodpeckers nesting there and a badger burrow. And the garden? There was a walled garden, and the gardener was nice. He used to let your father pick strawberries, but he had a stammer, and Dudley used to imitate him, and never mind Dudley, Finn said quickly. He's dead. What about the other servants? 
The butler was called young, but he wasn't young. He was old, with liver spots on his hand, and everyone was scared of him. He got a maid sacked for reading the books in the library. The one who helped your father. And the dining room. Clovis rattled through every detail of the dining room. It always cheered him up, thinking of English food and English meals. But as often as he felt brave and forward-looking, Clovis felt scared and told Finn that he couldn't do it. Wish Maya would come, he kept saying, which annoyed Finn. Finn wished it too. Till Maya came, they would not know what had happened in the museum and whether their plan would work. But when she did come, the next day, Finn saw by her face that all was well. To get away from the Carters, Maya had needed to work hard at her pulmonary spasm. She had a spasm at breakfast, wheezing and twitching, and another one in the drawing room when she was doing her embroidery. They were good spasms, she thought, but it wasn't until the third one, just before tea, that Miss Carter said icily, for her lungs were giving her so much trouble she had better go out. Since it was raining, the heavy dark rain that fell so often in the afternoon, she thought Maya might refuse, but she was out of the house in minutes. And Furo, thank heavens, was in his hut, ready to take her to Finn. This time the dog greeted her as a friend, placing his cold nose in her hand, and the happiness she always felt when she came to this place rose up in her. It's all settled, she said. The professor was wonderful. He showed me everything. And I stole the keys, she added proudly. At least I think I did, though he did tell me where they were, so that might not be proper stealing. She handed them to Finn, hoping for praise, but he had obviously expected her to do what he had asked. Good. The trap door may be difficult to lift. Lift. We'd better take some oil. And it's still under the sloth, is it? Yes, and the professor is still worried about the missing rib. How's Clovis? He's washing his hair. He's always washing it, said Finn gloomily. I thought you might cut it for him. I've never cut anyone's hair before. There's always the first time. Clovis came out of the hut then with a towel around his head, very pleased to see Maya. She's done it, Finn said. The hiding place is set up and she's got the keys. The boat goes at dawn on Saturday, so on Friday we'll get you settled there. We need blankets, a lamp, and some food. I'm going to let everyone think it's me hiding there even the native people, and that will make it safer. I'll tell them that the crows haven't heard about the lagoon. I have heard about the lagoon, but Clovis was looking definitely green. How long do I have to be in the cellar? He asked fearfully. Not even a whole night. The crows are due back on Friday afternoon. They'll come looking for you almost straight away. You will see it will work. Clovis, it's the best thing, honestly, said Maya. The goodlies have been turned back at the border. They've been locked up until they can sell their assets and clear their debts. I don't think you're, they think you're staying with me, so they won't bother about you anymore. I suppose I could stay here, said Clovis doubtfully, looking around the hut. No, you couldn't, said Finn. I won't be here, I told you. I'm sitting off in the Arabella. He turned to Maya. Come and, come and see her, he said. We've done quite a bit to her. Maya followed him on to the launch. The rain had stop, stopped, and Finn had painted the floorboards and mended the awning. She's almost ready, he said. Are you sure you can sail her alone without having to get with having to get wood and everything? Yes, I couldn't take you anyway, he said, reading her like a book. I don't even know where I'm going, and you're a... Don't say it, said Maya angrily. Don't say... You dare say that I'm a girl. Finn shrugged. All right, I won't, but it could be dangerous, and I won't involve other people. He looked back at the hut where Clovis was toweling his hair. He's absolutely hopeless with the chores, but he's amazing at memorizing things. I reckon he knows everything about Westwood already. We did Sir Aubrey this morning. His eyes, his whiskers, an actor's training is not to be sneezed at. Then, how long have you got? Long enough to help you polish the funnel, said Maya, and took a cloth. That's where we're going to end today, and we'll pick up tomorrow with Chapter 11. We've been reading Journey to the River Sea by Eva Abotson, illustrated by Kevin Hawks, and published by Puffin Books. Once again, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I hope to see you again here tomorrow. Bye.